Welcome back, everyone, to Cinematic Universe. My name is Mr. Martinez. Joining me as always is Catherine Cook. We are now going to continue our Road to Force Awakens with the Star Wars Clone Wars TV series. Not the 2D version, the 3D version. Going back to the original Star Wars, when George Lucas was first pitching this idea, he said he came up with the idea that the concept of Darth Vader was originally the Sanjuro or Yojimbo type character from the old, uh, you know, Kurosawa samurai films. And, of course, Darth Vader got expanded upon so much as a character that he, he wasn't really that character anymore. Darth Maul was pretty much closer to a Sanjuro type not a Yojimbo, of course, because he was still, you know, he had a master of people he followed. But uh, he ne needed to have a bounty hunter who really echoed that, because Boba Fett, as we've covered, is the most badass character with an unearned reputation. So we needed one who really earned that title, and Cad Bane was that character. Cad, he was angelized in the Star Wars universe. There's no other way of putting it. He had the looks, he had the moves, he was suave, he had the cadences, he had the, the style. And I liked his storylines that they fleshed them out. It wasn't just like single episodes, there were actual arcs to his. Though I do wish he probably appeared in a few more of them. I like that he doesn't have any loyalties one way or another. He's like, yeah, all I care about is the money I'm here to get paid, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And. He, some, he doesn't mind back-talking Darth Sidious of all people, like, you know, killing little children and kidnapping them, and it's a little low for your type of, like, not, not you know, big enough for your type of dreams, isn't it, you know? Yeah. And he was, like, just a, I love that kind of character, and then surrounding him, you have other bounty hunters, like, uh, you know, Embo, the guy who doesn't really say anything, he's got the huge hat, he brought back, uh, What's her name? The one in the orange jumpsuit with the sniper rifle. I, I really can't uh, remember her name right now. That's a good question. Yeah, she had one shot in episode one when she was watching the pod race. And since she had inspired just a bunch of spinoff comic books. And she's like another complex character. She's, yes, in it for the money. Very manipulative, especially Boba Fett. Mm -hmm. And you know, each bounty hunter kind of has their own depth to it. But those are got to be my three favorites. Yeah, I remember... I think it was the second season where they were advertising Rise of the Bounty Hunter, Star Wars, the Clone Wars series. And Cat Bane, as soon as he walks in, it's just like, oh, this guy means business. Not only does this guy mean business, but he is very resourceful. The design, the voice actor that they got for him, everything they did, it's like, this guy is, you know, what Boba Fett should have been, essentially, and all that stuff. I mean, because of this series, we actually do get to see an arc for Boba Fett later in the show, how he's becoming the bounty hunter that he end, ends up being. But I'm sorry, Cad Bane is the bounty hunter, and he's the one who really deserves all the attention. Um, hey, he walks right into a room of the senators when he says, you're all hostages, and one guy doesn't believe him, he just shoots him dead, no problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everything about him was great. Uh, I like the... He's, on top of that, he's got the humor, too. Yeah, exactly. And then you have the supporting bounty hunters. You also have that the lady that we just talked about. Um, the squid-looking fellow with the metal hat and all that stuff. Uh, he's kind of like the sniper with his um, with his pet animal. And then you have the robot that looks like a freaking Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. But that guy's no slouch. He, he'll murder you without a second thought. So that was one of the first very good highlights of of the Star Wars Clone Wars series expanding upon you know they have their own mythology bounty hunters are a dime a dozen in, in the Star Wars universe and they deserve to have their own story arc because they are a very integral part to the Star Wars canon I mean we saw them in the in the original trilogy so it's good that they were you know getting their their due they even had bounty hunters and mercenaries and murderers train the clone troopers in the few episodes when they showed you how the clone troopers are trained, they had to enlist the help of bounty hunters and mercenaries to train them in combat and all that stuff. So, you know... Oh, yeah, they used a bounty hunter for the clone template, even. <laughs> exactly. Um, but even then, a guy like Cad Bane still has, uh, you know, his own code. Like, there's an episode about box where they're trying to, you know, compete to see who's going to be Dooku's golden boy. Mm -hmm. And... 
he Bane doesn't just throw everybody under the bus. Not just because he has to survive and rely on people, but at the end, he kind of saves Obi Wan's life, even though he doesn't know it's him because he thinks the guy putting him through it is just a douchebag. And he's like, "Hey, there's like a brotherhood amongst us here, and you can't fuck us like that." <laughs> exactly, and. It shows that Bad Cat Bane is not exactly a slouch either because I remember an episode, I forget the name of it, where he kills a Jedi, he grabs a Jedi's lightsaber, and he goes one-on-one -on -one with Obi-Wan Kenobi. Granted, he loses that fight, but he's not afraid to fight a Jedi if it means, you know, having him either escape or taking down the person who's trying to kill him. I mean, it's like, this guy doesn't fuck around. Even when you capture it, it's just like, you win this round, Kenobi. I'll be back. <laughs> perfect species choice for him too the duro he looks so menacing and perfect for it I always thought he looked like a giant bug I mean the way his <laughs> eyes are designed is like this guy reminds me of the fly for some reason I don't know what it and, is and the idea they said why he has the tubes coming out of the side of his face is to counteract a force jump. so that's the bounty hunters part the, the one I want to talk about is the relationship that is created thanks to the series you have the clone troopers and you have the relationship between them and the Jedi in the first season you have Yoda challenging Asajj Ventress and the uh, 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 Count Dooku wants Asajj Ventress to get that the leader of that one planet to, to sign you, oh, yeah. yeah to sign the Treaty of the Trade Federation roots and then you have Yoda going there to listen we want you to, under our care, under our protection, and it's like, all right, well, I'm very neutral here, so one of you two is going to have to show me who's the better who's the better protection detail, the Federation Army or the Clone War Army. And I remember when the clone troopers, um, they all look the same. It's There's no denying that. They all look the same, but they all have different, you know, hair designs. They have tattoos on their face. They have very different key elements to separating them and Yoda makes this very clear one of them says sir we're all clones we're expendable we're nothing and he tells them no you're something you you're brave you 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 sometimes you know you're the first person to start shooting when you're told not to shoot and then you you're the one who's always the, you're the brains of the operation so you all are very unique in your own way even though you're all clones and you're all bred from the same genetic code so that's how we mentioned it in our review with Revenge of the Sith, when you see Yoda killing all those clone troopers like nothing, it really, you know, there should be an emotional weight there, and it's not there. Because the relationship between the clone troopers and the, Je the, the Jedi is just lost. And, you know, again, double-edged sword here. Even, even better than that episode was the the fifth episode where you just had it all, just all the clones on that moon base having to fend off this invasion of, uh, you know, the commando droids. And those particular five guys, that they get split up at the end of the episode, but you end up, or it ends up with three of them, two of them die, but you kind of follow their journey through the rest of the entire series across the various seasons. Mm -hmm. And one of them ends up being the one who discovers... Order 66, yep. and gets killed before it. But each of those characters has an arc which continues throughout the entire saga of the series. And this episode was one of the best used by the critics because they loved how it just took what was an arc, supposed to be, like you said, an expendable army and turned them into real characters you could actually care about and identify as individuals. And then you have Commander Cody. You remember in episode three, Commander Cody is the one who gets the first order to, you know, execute Order 66, and he fires at Obi-Wan Kenobi, and then when you see the series, you see the relationship between Commander Cody and General Kenobi, you know, they're brothers in arms, practically, in this war that nobody chose to be a part of, but they have to fight in order to, you know, protect the peace in the universe. And then you have six wise uh, Dogma, all these other characters, and it's a tragedy, really, when you also get to that episode that you just talked about, when he discovers the Order 66, and, ah, uh, I hate it when something really good comes after something that wasn't that good. <laughs> it just doesn't balance well, but I really, 
here's the thing with the clones. The my favorite part that had not only just the relationship between the clones and what the clones stand for is when they have to fight against General Krell. This bastard of a Jedi who turns to the dark side. He doesn't call any of the clone troopers by their names. He calls them by their product number. Yeah. He literally actually... treats them like soulless meat bags, basically. I was really upset that the final twist of that is that he turned to the dark side because I thought it really would have driven the point home about how the Jedi really don't respect the clones at all. If you just had him be a guy who just expects them to be the best because he is a Jedi and has all of these abilities that they don't, just as like, you're bred to be, you know, my, my cannon fodder, be better than me. Which is why then he says, oh, I'm on the dark side and I'm trying to sabotage you. I thought that was kind of a lame cop-out. It kind of just takes away the entire argument that goes on between that series about how the Republic is fighting an army of apparently, you know, mindless, slaveless droids, and yet the Jedi are fighting with an army they regard as the same thing, even though they're not. Yeah, but at least the build-up with General Krell, I mean, it's unforgettable. It's like, first of all, he kind of makes Darth Maul kind of look like a, like a secondary because he uses two double-bladed swords with his forearms and everything like that. And I'm like, oh my god, this guy is a monster. And it's like, I refuse to be taken into custody by a creature bred in some laboratory. <laughs> and I'm like, run! He's going to kill you! And he starts killing one clone trooper after another. It's amazing they were able to subdue him the way they did. And it kind of shows that yeah, these clone troopers, I mean, the seeds of Order 66 and the things that happened in Episode 3 are cemented here. But it shows that while that one Jedi was a tough nugget to take down, it shows that they were trained to take down even a Jedi like General Krell. But that kind of goes back to what I was saying, is that if General Krell hadn't turned to the dark side and he was just like an extension of how the Jedi just, you know treat all of the other uh, clones, then it's understandable how a lot of the clones wouldn't have too much of a problem going through with finally killing a lot of the Jedi, because they've been following them around for this entire war, where they constantly have to risk, you know, hundreds of them to get one Jedi back, and you know, stuff like, which has no strategic value, just, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, oh, we can't leave any brother left behind if they're a Jedi, <laughs> you know, but yeah. oh, if they're a clone, who cares? Mm. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, what's next? What other arc we wanted to talk about? Um, Satine. Ah, that's just Satine. Right to the freaking feels. It really shows just how awesome the character of Obi-Wan Kenobi is. How selfless he is. Yeah. It never gets old. It never stops hurting when you... I mean, the way their relationship grows and all that stuff. Uh, it drives the stake in Anakin to make you hate him more. Yes. Yes, it does. I mean... Because of all the sacrifices that Obi-Wan made with his relationship with Satine, whereas all the evil things Anakin will do to selfishly protect his own, it's like, come on. Add to the fact that Anakin starts giving him shit for, do you like her? And all that stuff. I'm like, yeah, mister, I'm hiding a wife who's pregnant in the on the sidelines. Fuck you. Yeah, I know. It's like, come on, shut the fuck up. Yeah, it's like, god damn it. I hate it when so, when a relationship is written so well and the, nothing comes out of it but tragedy. It's just, it's not fair. It's not fair. And Satine is kind of making that even worse because, yeah, we like that she's a pacifist, but she's extremely naive about it given the state of the galaxy. Yeah, you can't expect to be completely neutral when you have an army of mercenaries on your nearby moon. Who are in a, a army of se a galactic sized army of separatists coming your way, and the Republic's like, hey, you know, you're sitting ducks. Yeah, and at least the good thing about the storyline between Duchess Satine and Obi Wan Kenobi is we got to see the a story arc with the Mandalorians. It makes real. It really makes uh, Jango Fett look like a wimp compared to the how the how you know the size and power that came from the Mandalorian when they started taking, you know, control of everything else. 
Especially, what was the blonde guy's name? The one with the black sword? He was the Mandalorian leader. Yeah. That guy and all that stuff. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm bad with names. And it's a lot of characters in this series. And I can't exactly keep up with all these names. I just know that I... I mean, the real important characters, those are the ones I remember. And in this case, we have Duchess of Teen and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Which leads to the return of another character. And we'll talk about that later. But if... There is one character who really went through the ringer and he still managed to compose himself and still stick to the code that he lives by, that he's trained by, that he's fought for. It's Obi-Wan Kenobi. And he is quite possibly the the one character in the whole series that you really have to respect because everybody lost everything, but man, Obi-Wan really lost a lot as well. And he just, chin up, don't cry, don't don't feel sorry for yourself, and move yeah. on. It's kind of like the reverse of what you have in the original trilogy. Kind of like, a, you know, because in episode one, he loses his master. And episode two, even though he doesn't realize it yet, he's pretty much lost the respect and devotion of his Padawan, because, mm-hmm. you know, Anakin decides to get married. And then in the third one, uh, he's lost everything else. It's a tragedy, and he has to go off and live by himself. And that relates to the original trilogy and the, what happens with Luke, how he, you know, he loses his aunt and uncle, and then the guy he comes to respect more than anyone, being Kenobi, he loses him. Uh, he can't get the girl because the girl's a sister. That <laughs> 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 his father is the bad guy ruling the universe, and on the one hand, he he, he tries his damnedest to redeem him, and while he succeeds, he still fails to, you know, he, he can have his cake a little bit, or maybe have a little slice of pie, but he can't eat it too. And in the end, it's like, yeah, they've won, but he's still lost so much, and you kind of expect him to go off, and who knows where he's going to be when we see The Force Awakens, but it's kind of the same. I was really making that parallel between the two, especially when they queued in Duchess Satine, because you're seeing how Obi-Wan's able to set everything aside, and it doesn't tug at his heartstrings too much all the time. Like, a couple times he's talking to Satine, and he's starting to space out a little bit, and Anakin's like, Hey man, you know, kind of rubbing it in, and then he's like, he's like, yeah, we'll mess with your girlfriend later. Go get her, go get your girlfriend. I'll be right back. And he runs down the hall. And I was like, yes, yes. Wait, wait, she's not my girlfriend. You know? No, but then you remember that one part where she's being held hostage, and they're trying to, you know, act out a way to have her, you know, you know, escape from the grip of the person who's got a gun pointed to her head. And then she's, st- I mean, it's all an act, but at the same time, I always felt that she was actually confessing her love for him just to distract the guy who held her at, at gunpoint. And I remember when I saw that episode, the, you know, at the time, I don't know what was happening with my TV, tele- my, my service provider, but a lot of the episodes of Star Wars, I was watching them in Spanish, which... I'm not com- going to complain about it because I'm Puerto Rican. Spanish is my first language. But when you're watching an entire show in one language and it just changes out of nowhere, it's a little distracting. So when you see her confessing his love in Spanish, I'm just like, Dios mío, ¿qué está pasando? <laughs> <laughs> it just turned into a telenovela out of nowhere and everybody's confessing <laughs> their love. Were, were, they, were the voice dubbers at least trying to act it and not just like, you know, reading it? No, they were acting it, especially the guy who was acting for Obi Wan Kenobi. It's like, you know, but it didn't he, sound too soapy. It still sounded kind of good. It sounded good. It's like, yo entiendo que tú sientes estos sentimientos por mí, pero no, no puedo. Mi allegiance la orden no puede seguir. Yo estoy, oh my god, what's happening here? But when I went and saw that episode again in English, it still didn't take away from anything. the 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 emotional weight was right there, so. Obi-Wan Kenobi, you sly dog, you bastard. <laughs> uh, well, we might as well talk about... Um, the next... The next arc. arc. Thing. I love how they introduce it, too, with this episode where it's like... Or not the episode, there was a trilogy of, you know, Savage Press, and they give this whole background about... Uh, on uh, Iridonium, where the uh, that species comes from, where those... The Knights brothers Sisters. come from and the whole witches of the mist and all that kind of thing and they got into that whole story and this guy man you feel really bad for him and everything that they make him do even killing his own little brother and 
at the end of this whole thing where he loses everything and kind of goes through the same, <laughs> some of the same things that Obi-Wan pretty much went through, except in a much shorter time span. And, uh, and he goes off on this quest and we knew what it, the quest was going to be and what the point was of bringing this character back before it was ever even mentioned. You knew you're going to be going to see that guy who got thrown under the bus by bad writing. who was so oversold as being the next big bad guy who had the, one of the coolest lightsaber fights ever. Darth Maul. Maul. And I love that first episode, the way they introduce it, where it's just an incredibly slow burn approach. Like when he's on the planet where it's like acid rain and he's with the snake. And I just love that stuff. It's like a classic, you know, old fairy tale type storyline where it's like you're, except it reads almost like the knight going off to slay the monster and those little guys leading him there, except he's not there to slay the monster. He wants to embrace it, yet he gets there. And sorry, fairy tale rules. It has to be a monster. And it reminded me very much of the whole Shelob's Lair sequence from The Return of the King because of the way Maul had made his entire apparatus. And I thought, at first it was really shocking when you see what they had done with the character, but then you sit back for a second and it's like, yeah, this makes a hell of a lot of sense when you think about how how evil the, the Sith training is and how arrogant the Sith are and how superior and elitist they are to have failed and been, you know, virtually abandoned, how he's just lost his mind through hatred, because the Sith are all about hate, of course he's going to want vengeance, and you see what has become of him, and you kind of feel pity for Darth Maul, and it's like, man, you've really been through the ringer, but then the turnaround time, I mean, I kind of didn't like the idea that, you know, he brings him back to the, you know, Mother Talzin, and she kind of uses the spell to make him, to snap him out of that funk, because that was such a psychological downturn, I wanted to see that if he could have come face to face with Obi Wan, if that could have started, you know, luring him back up, rather than just doing oh the magic cop out thing. But once you get past that, it's like revenge mode, and this is an evil fucking Sith Lord. This is what you want. This is like you know, like the Darth Vader comic books where you see him being a real evil guy, which you didn't get to see in the movies as much. You get to see this from Darth Maul in the storyline, and it is epic. And he just takes. Everything from everyone, including Obi Wan Kenobi, and they don't really milk it because they don't overdo it, but they they do use them just enough and in all the right ways. Yeah, you know how they say that the sand a sand planet is where all the powerful warriors come from, be them good or evil. <laughs> the sons and sisters of Datomir, quite possibly one of, if not my most favorite planet in the Star Wars series. Because they give birth to the Night Sisters, and I love the Night Sisters, Mother Talisman, and then you have Savage Oppress and Darth Maul, which is amazing how Darth Maul was the only one out of there who wasn't born yellow or orange; he was born red. So you have to wonder, you know, who was the person who had like the skip a generation to have him be born all red? But his, um, when, as you explained, when we see him for the first time after so long how broken he is, how he just basically looks like a piece of scrap metal that was, you know, trying to rebuild himself into his glory days. His glory days were gone. He was just a former, a shell of his former self. And I understand the whole cop-out with the magic to snap him out of it, but after that, it just boom, boom, boom. One oh, exactly. home run after the other. The part where Savage and... And Darth Maul raid that, um, they find all those credits in that vault in that room after killing all those police squadron. And he's like, brother, look, all this money, it'll last us a full lifetime. We need more than just money. Money will only get us somewhere. And then, and then you see Savage, he, he doesn't like the way he's talking, so he pulls out his double-bladed lightsaber. And then you see Darth Maul, ah. <sighs> It seems another lesson is in order. And it shows just how strong he is compared to Savage and how he's teaching him as an apprentice. It's just like, I'm so glad this guy's back. It's yeah. Which, it ties again to Darth Maul wanting revenge against Obi-Wan Kenobi. We go back to the home planet of Duchess Satine. Darth Maul uses the the Mandalorians to take over the planet. He does. He takes Duchess Satine hostage. And then he kills her in front of Obi-Wan Kenobi. 
and we already talked about the tragedy there, but then we get to see a confrontation that I wasn't expecting, but I'm glad it happened. And at the same time, I didn't exactly like how it ended. But you have Darth Maul with Savage versus Darth Sidious. And it just shows that... I know I talked about how much of a monster General Grievous was, but it shows that Darth Sidious doesn't give a shit. He'll handle anything you throw his way. And it of was course. a losing battle from the start. I mean, kill Savage like that. Like that. But it's it sees that every it shows that every time you think they have the the upper hand, Sidious just turns it around just like that. Oh, you force push me off the clip, I'm gonna grab you too and check you with me. It just shows. I didn't like the way that that battle ended when you when you have Darth Sidious begging for his life. He's not a character who begs. Oh, he, Darth Maul. Yeah, yeah, Darth Maul. The only time I would have bought him begging was if you if it, it was him when Savage found him in the scrap plant, and that I couldn't yeah, believe. Yeah, especially after the way he started treating Savage when he came back into being this really tough badass, just to start begging. Yeah, it just comes off as rather bad. Well, I know that a comic book series came out called Darth Maul, Son of Dathomir. That pretty much wraps up the whole story there. I've yet to read it, so hopefully we'll see yeah, how that ends. Yeah, because that's another thing I hated about Clone Wars is that, you know, Sidious did make a direct point at the end there that, oh, you know, I have more plans for you. I'm not going to have special plans for you. And I figured that if they weren't going to solve them and or reveal them in that season, they would in the season six, which was like the, you know, the unaired bonus season, mm -hmm. but they did. Yeah, which was a complete you know, lost opportunity. And as oh, far no, as we're like, not no, gonna... they have not brought him back in the Rebels series. Yeah, yeah, we're not going to give you that, that the closing arc to Darth Maul. Instead, we're going to give you three episodes of Jar Jar Binks because that was a smart choice because that needed to be what, seen. Was, it, was that the one that followed? I can't remember. That was in the, that as before uh, Yoda finds out what's going to happen in, in the future. That's when Mace Windu has teamed up with Jar Jar and then Jar Jar finds love and all that shit. Yeah, but... Right, before we, oh, sorry. Yeah, before we which, move on to the next thing, that's the one thing I wanted to bring up, is that you have a lot of opportunities for really good writing to go down certain avenues that they don't do because of, you know, the repetition. Like, I'd say about a good 50% of the storylines is always there's a neutral planet that the Separatists are trying to attack and Dooku's trying to, you know, wine and dine the leaders to sign their treaty and it's like they gotta find another way to sneak in and stop them and that's like 50% of the storylines and I'm like you've come up with so many rich characters be it through you know pre Vizsla the Mandalorian guy you've brought back Darth Maul you've done a lot of potential with Grievous you have Hondo Naka the pirate guy you know you have Cad Bane all these other characters like come on come up with something unique and enrich it rather than recycling that boring formula over and over because we get that it's a war that it's huge in scale but have a different approach to it than just doing that over and over again, you know? Yeah, which kind of puts me in to fear for what the Force of Wiccan is going to be, because so far it feels like it's going to be a almost... I mean, okay, yeah. Episode 1, Desert Planet, here's your character, we're going to follow him for the rest of the series. Luke Skywalker, Desert Planet, he's the hero, we're going to follow him for the rest of the series. Now we have Ray and Finn, Desert Planet. We're going to follow him for the rest of the series. Okay, I understand that. That is an ongoing thing with these movies. But I think at some point you're going to have to t tell yourself, come on, guys. <laughs> yeah, it feels much more like it's picking up from the original Star Wars, you know, except, you know, take away, you know, Luke and Leia and swap them with Ray and Finn. Take away old man you know, old Ben Kenobi and swap him with old Han Solo and, you know, take away the Death Star and replace it with that big thing, you know, you know, could take away Vader and replace it with, the guy. yeah, you know, it kind of feels that way. I see what you're saying there, definitely. Yeah, but hopefully at the end of the day, it's not, you know, I, I hope yeah. my, my cynicism and my depression here doesn't, doesn't go. Well, sure, so on the one hand, I don't doubt that we're going to love the movie, even if it is uh, very much faithful to the formula of the originals. But I don't want to feel a few months after the movie comes out when we've had a chance to cool down and think about it that, you know, it's kind of just a rehash and not really anything new. But that's going off on a tangent. Yeah, and eventually we will review that when the movie comes out. Um, hopefully. 
I get to get everybody else that we I've reviewed with to do that movie. Um, next up, we have... You know, I like how in that one episode where Darth Sidious is having an argument with Count Dooku, that through the hologram, he force chokes Count Dooku. Yeah. It's like, it shows just how much power how much power this guy has. <laughs> that he's able to force choke somebody through a hologram. There is a joke about that when Family Guy did their Empire Strikes Back episode. Stewie's Darth Vader. And it's the scene when they, they come out of hyperspace too close to Hoth and the rebels see him. And then Stewie starts choking the guy who did it through the TV. He's like, yeah, didn't know I could force choke people through the TV, did you? But I can. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, Vader does that all the time in Empire Strikes Back. He starts killing people because, uh, you know, he's talking to them because they lost another Star Destroyer and an asteroid or whatnot. And he's talking to this guy. And you see him just, <laughs> he falls over dead on the hologram. Yeah. I think the last couple of arcs that we can talk about is when Anakin Skywalker, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Ahsoka Tano go into that, the source of all power that is the Force, and he meets the sons and daughters of the Force, the son who's at the dark side, the daughter who's on the jet, the light side, basically, and the grandfather who's basically the balance in the two and all that stuff. You end up you end up seeing Anakin Skywalker since he's the chosen one, the child of prophecy, and all that stuff. How he finally gets to see that he becomes Darth Vader and all that stuff, and we get to see the return of Qui Gon Jinn because the Force is so strong in that area that Qui Gon Jinn comes back with Liam Neeson voicing him. Yeah, uh, I like that part of the series because it shows again the mythology that is the Star Wars series. And it never once talks about the midichlorians. It just shows that the that the force is in, in, in a living entity that is just spread out around the galaxy, and at least it's concentrated in one area that is not exactly constantly in one place. It's just moving from one area to the other. I thought it's interesting that it still doesn't address the question of you know always it has to be balanced in the force, but there's nothing mathematically balanced about you know having. You know, all the Sith dead and non-existent, and just there being Jedi. And granted, Jedi a Sith isn't equivalent with dark side, and Jedi isn't equivalent with light, light side. It's just usually that's the way they kind of go. Because of course, you know, Dooku was a Jedi. He kind of became a you know left on his own, and you know, you look at how the Sith came along too. But it's like, you know, the, it's always about oh, the bringing balance to the Force. It's like, well, what exactly is balance? You have to have one without. You can't have one without the other, and. That's why they go. They each get shown the various uh, revelations that they're shown, and the episode is, uh, or that trilogy is very deliberately ambiguous uh, yeah. for the viewer. Whereas, according to the uh, Dave Filoni, the supervising director, he and George Lucas and the writing team, they all have very specific answers for every mystery to that particular arc. Uh, and it was really trippy, you know how the the grandfather chooses to, you know, he can see all the death, and he knows all the death and destruction, which is going to come from Anakin, uh, I see, I just made you yawn for the computer, it's, yeah, I see, I have that power, so it's, <laughs> it's the idea that, you know, <laughs> we've been talking for a long time, it's bound to happen to me at some point, <laughs> so it's a, the grandfather knows that all these terrible things are going to happen, and yet, he deems that it's okay for all this suffering and stuff to happen, so I guess, yeah, you can see how he is part of the balance because he's on the one hand allowing all this evil, but he says it's going to give way to all this light. But the notion of that being achieved by way of Anakin taking the, fa the father's place and staying there, I didn't get how that was going to happen, you know? Because he eventually comes to the idea that I'm just going to, you know, give you amnesia so you forget everything my son showed you so you can go out and fulfill your prophecy. Whereas beforehand, he's like, you're here because you're going to take my place. And, you know, it was kind of flip-flopping around there, and I was trying to figure out exactly what was going on with that storyline. It was a bit, you know, I, I don't even have the answers to it. I've been thinking about it for four years now. I don't know, Almost even after five. watching it, again, I still don't understand what they were going for there. But at least, I think what I enjoy more was just, like, like the embodiment of the dark side and the embodiment of the light side. That's the stuff that I kind of enjoyed, that it's kind of very, you know, out there. It's beyond lightsabers. It's beyond... Um, battleships, it's just, you know, you know, it's beyond, you know, basic comprehension, understanding. That's what I 
kind of liked about that that part. And but again, it's open to interpretation and all that stuff. I mean, like you said about the old man, he knows that he's, he's what the prophet is going to be, so he gives him the amnesia. But then we go later in the finale of the series through the last episodes where Yoda goes through his trials and he starts seeing what happened to Master Sifo Diaz, how that Darth Sidious is Palpatine and all that stuff, that Palpatine is Darth Sidious, which you have to be blind out of your mind not to know that, that twist yeah. coming. And it shows that one hint of moment where what if Count Dooku never went to the dark side? What if Anakin and Obi-Wan didn't exactly have to become enemies? What if? And then you have that one area where where Yoda seems to be at peace. And it shows that at the end of that, that Yoda knew what was going to happen. And he decided not to tell anyone because deep down he's just like, this has to happen and we can't stop it. No matter what. Yet it completely conflicts. I haven't seen that episode yet. I read, read a sort of a synopsis on it. But that completely goes against the grain of episode three. Because you can tell he's very... Exactly. Genuinely angry and hurt and impassioned and surprised by everything that happens as it's happening. Exactly, which is what we, what we, what I said earlier that con continuity wise, it doesn't fit with the overall story of the prequels because that's what I said earlier. You either choose the prequels and jump into the original trilogy, or you choose the Clone Wars but series and then jump even, into the trilogy. But even in the way the Clone Wars series handled it, the fact that Yoda is the Grand Master. If he believes the galaxy has to take this turn like this, as the Grand Master of the Jedi, he can say, hey, we're leaving this temple. The galaxy doesn't need us right now. It needs something different. And we're going to go exile ourselves somewhere else rather than just sitting by to be slaughtered. Because even if you take the Clone War continuity, if Yoda finds out all about that that's going to happen, uh, you know, I have a hard time believing with him knowing that. He'd be callous enough to defend himself from clone troopers and the other clone troopers down when he's getting, you know, getting stuff, you know, trying to keep himself alive. But oh, fuck everybody else, you know. <laughs> I don't know about that. Yeah, the Star Wars is such an. It's like wishful thinking. It's like a, a what if the whole episode is a what if scenario. Yeah. What right. if you could just kind of set these little side things? Like yes, but he'd have to be a real callous bastard. It's like yeah. oh, maybe we'll just set that aside to look at the, uh, you know, the figurative idea behind it. Yeah. But yeah, I really did love that trilogy of episodes because it went so much against the grain for what you usually get out of Clone Wars. Like, wow, a trilogy, an episode set about the Force, and it's bringing back the mysticism to it, and the, it's just pure mythology, especially when you see how they came across that place. It's like a diamond-shaped spaceship or something, even though it's more like a non-existent place on a plane, you know? Mm-hmm. I guess the last thing that we can talk about is we kind of talked about General Grievous earlier <laughs> and General Grievous even has a few episodes devoted to himself when you have Kid Fisto and Nadar and a group of clone troopers going to his secret planet hideout <laughs> and they're all trying to hunt him down and stuff and you finally get to see how General Grievous switches his parts when he needs to get fixed and all that stuff. <coughs> Yet at the end of the day, he never got to fix his lung situation. I mean, I it always felt like wow, they're really it really shows just how weak the character was getting as progression versus how powerful he was originally. But it never really translates well to how he ends up being in the movies and all that stuff. Yeah, because even in the Clone Wars series, he's just it's still that chicken shit cowardly kind of thing. It's like I figured with everything else that was going right in Clone Wars that. It would, uh, you know, they would write it, you know, go back to how they introduced Grievous in the 2D version mm -hmm. as being this really badass, great white hunter type of guy, and you don't really get any... I mean, Jar Jar Binks and his trio of retards were able to capture him in an episode. That's how bad it got for General Grievous. Yeah, it did. How could you ream him that badly? He needs his moment to shine. And it didn't really happen. The closest they came, I felt, was that episode you just talked about. Uh, even though he doesn't really do much himself in the episode, he's kind of just, you know, he's there, and that character kind of gets to boss him around as he starts getting put back together. But uh, And there were some cool moments, you know, with Grievous every once in a while. But he was, again, when you look at the numbers of, what is it, like 120 episodes or whatever, he was vastly underused. Yeah, and then you have that episode where Grievous goes to 
Dathomir to against the Night Sisters. All right, that was cool. I meant. Yeah, <laughs> at that point, I'm just like, come on, Grievous, you can you can take her on. And then again, as always, he feels like he's about to lose, so he asks his entire army to fire <laughs> and all that stuff. <laughs> The one last thing they did do very well is that they gave much more depth and logical reasoning to why Anakin would turn to the dark side. They gave so much more re for why he would distrust them uh, a lot more. Like with that quadrilogy of episodes of Obi-Wan going undercover and going as far as to fake his death mm -hmm. without even telling Anakin and you know things like that. That was the other thing they did very well, which if they had had the same writers on the prequels... Uh, for at least the Anakin part uh, and the Anakin department of the storyline, it would have been scores better. It would have been, which I'm thankful I have. We have the Clone Wars trilogy really, because at least that way we can actually see the character the way he should have been, rather than how he ended up being. Last minute thing: What did you think of the introduction to the Star Wars Clone Wars when they did the the movie the first time around? What did you think of that? The movie itself. The movie itself before the series. Yeah, it was like a TV movie, but even had they done it as a TV movie, it's still a really lame kind of... I mean, it would be okay if you did that later on in the series or maybe in season one type of thing, but not to kick off the series. Yeah. Especially given how great the writing becomes. But then again, the writing did improve a hell of a lot after season one. I mean, not that I'm knocking season one. It had some pretty cool stuff, pretty fun stuff in there, like with the... What is it, R3, the evil droid who's trying to kill everybody? Yeah. And, you know, the R2-D2 and R3 fight and things like that. But, uh, yeah, that was definitely not a theatrical type of thing. I actually didn't see that film until uh, until maybe when they were airing season three because it came on television. And I was like, that, that was how they chose to premiere this series? Really? Because, of course, when they launched the show uh, two months after that movie came out, they already had several, pretty much almost all of the season one episodes were well into pre-production for several months by that time. So it's not like they hadn't thought of any other storylines yet, but they went with that one. And I'm thinking, with your pilot episode of the series going to your original point about Yoda bringing out the, uh, you know, the depth to these characters of, you know, making the clones stand out as individuals and all that, and yet, no, they went with this really lame story for, it's like, no! <laughs> This is Star Wars The Clone Wars. That's our time here is talking about The Clone Wars. And that's our closing of the prequel stories. And join us next time as we talk about the first Star Wars movie, Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. My name is Resto Martinez. Joining me as always is Catherine Cook. Thank you for joining us, Cat. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>